Welcome back, everyone, to another episode of Space This Week, the Monday show where we recap all the news relating to space and spaceflight, as well as give you a nice overview of all the launches and major spaceflight events set to take place over the next seven days. Furthermore, we'll be delving into the fascinating world of spaceflight history in our upcoming anniversary segment, and I do hope you enjoy what we have lined up for you today. Before we get started, make sure you've hit that subscribe button down below so that you never miss one of these videos in order to guarantee that the information you're receiving is as up-to-date and relevant as possible. Anyway, I think that ticks all the boxes of stuff that needs saying in the intro, so let's commence the first segment of the show, all the space events that we saw take place last week. Last week, we had the very first launch of 2021. This was a SpaceX Falcon 9, which took flight on the 8th of January from Cape Canaveral. On board was a Turkish TurkSat-5A satellite, which was successfully placed in a geosynchronous orbit. The satellite itself is a communication satellite and is a rather controversial one at that. In October 2020, mass protests gathered outside of SpaceX's headquarters to protest the launch of the satellite, as the previous generation, the TurkSat-4B, directly commanded hundreds of bombing drones in Azerbaijan, Syria, Libya, and many other countries, resulting in thousands of deaths in the targeted military installations. As for the Falcon 9 itself, its first stage landed around 670 kilometers downrange on the Just Read the Instructions drone ship, bringing an end to this booster's fourth successful flight. An attempt to catch the payload fairing was made by fairing catcher ship Ms. Chief, but unfortunately she wasn't successful with the catch this time around, and recovery from the water was made instead. Now, TurkSat 5A was the only launch we saw from SpaceX, or anyone else for that matter, last week, but it's not the only SpaceX activity from last week. We also saw the successful short-duration static fire of Starship SN9 on the 6th of January over at Boca Chica, Texas, which brings us one step closer to witnessing SpaceX's second high-altitude flight test of a Starship prototype. Corey has once again knocked things out of the park with this amazing animation of what the launch will hopefully look like, a very similar flight plan to the SN8, but this time around, hopefully there'll be less fire and explosions at the end. You can watch the full animation via the on-screen link and in the link in the description. As for the other Starship and Super Heavy prototypes, work continues unimpeded. I once again refer to the great work of Brendan Lewis, who's hot on the tail of Starship development and continually produces these high-quality renders of where we stand with each vehicle's construction. You can check out his Twitter from the link in the description. I'm going to wrap up our coverage of last week's events here, but before moving to our next segment, I'm going to shamelessly ask that if you're enjoying this video so far, then do remember to leave a like down below to help support us. And with that, let's move on to talk about all the launches and events expected to happen over the next seven days. Our first flight of the week is Virgin Orbit's Launcher 1 vehicle. We'd hoped to see this air-launched rocket take flight at the end of last week, but the launch was then pushed back to Wednesday the 13th of January. The flight will begin with the takeoff of Virgin Orbit's modified 747 aircraft, named Cosmic Girl, from the Bajavi Air and Spaceport in California. It'll ascend to high altitude before deploying the two-stage rocket from underneath its left wing. If this flight succeeds, then it'll be the first successful orbit from Virgin's air launch system. The first attempt in May 2020 started off well, but but unfortunately the rocket failed to reach space after a high-pressure propellant line failed, causing liquid oxygen to stop flowing to the engine and consequently resulting in engine shutoff. Virgin have subsequently strengthened the components that failed and are now confident that aside from the fuel line failure, all other systems involved in the aerodynamics of the vehicle, including the fins, acted as expected during the test flight, so here's hoping that no further failures thwart launch one and we'll see it successfully reach orbit this time around. Inside the payload fairing are seven American technology demonstration satellites and two American research satellites. One will research microgravity and one will research the atmosphere. Our second launch of the week will be from Rocket Lab, who will be launching their workhorse electron rocket from the Mahia Peninsula in New Zealand on the 16th of January. The mission, dubbed Another One Leaves the Crust, will carry a single communication microsatellite for European Multinational Technology Corporation, OHBSE. The 10-day launch window will open just as the sun sets over the Mahia Peninsula launch site, so if there are no delays with the flight, then we should get a nice twilight liftoff, much like Rocket Lab's Don't Stop Me Now mission from last year. Rocket Lab has no intention of recovering the first stage of the Electron for this particular flight. 
We had hoped to see a Falcon 9 launch this week on the 14th of January, but this was unfortunately pushed back to the 21st. Luckily, we're still going to get another Falcon 9 launch to take its place this week. On the 17th of January, SpaceX will be conducting their first Starlink launch of the year, taking off from the Kennedy Space Center on Sunday. The flight will be pretty much the same as previous Falcon 9 Starlink launches. The first stage is expected to land just over 600 kilometers downrange on the Just Read the Instructions drone ship, and we can safely assume that SpaceX plan on recovering the fairings as well. Not long after the first stage landing, we can expect the 60 Starlink satellites to separate safely from the upper stage. Now, Starlink may be the final rocket launch of the week, but it's not the final piece of spaceflight activity news that we can talk about, because also on Sunday, the Parker Solar Probe will make its seventh perihelion. Perihelion is the point in the probe's orbit in which it's closest to the sun. This time, it'll be getting a toasty 14.2 gigameters from the center of the sun, though it's still not close enough for it to complete its primary mission. Over the next four years, the probe will continue to conduct four more Venus flybys to lower its perihelion down to a distance of just 6.9 gigameters from the center of the sun. And once there, it'll perform a thorough analysis of our parent star, including electromagnetic field investigations, imaging of the corona and inner heliosphere, and solar wind analysis. Some of you may remember the launch of the probe, which took off aboard a Delta IV Heavy in 2018. Unfortunately, we have a few years to wait until we get to start talking about really juicy data from the spacecraft, but it's nonetheless fun to talk about when I get the chance. Anyway, I think that's enough rambling for this week's upcoming events. Which launch are you most excited for? For me, it's gotta be the launcher one. But this week aside, it's time for our final segment now, all the most interesting historic spaceflight anniversaries set to take place this week. <laughs> Our first historic space anniversary this week is on Tuesday the 12th of January, which will mark the launch of NASA's Deep Impact space probe, which took off from Cape Canaveral on a Delta II rocket in 2005. The mission's objective was to study the comet Tempel-1, specifically through means of launching an impactor probe into the nucleus of the comet itself. This dramatic action was conducted on the 4th of July in 2005, and the impactor created a sizable impact crater on the comet's surface, blasting debris from the interior of of the nucleus in the process. The Deep Impact spacecraft was able to study the debris, which included ice and dust from deep within the comet, in order to further our understanding of what comets are made of. From the excavation of debris, scientists were able to determine that the comet had water ice both on its surface and deep within its interior, with one member of the scientific team describing it as being like a skating rink made of snowy dirt. The photographs taken by the spacecraft showed that the comet was more dusty than initially thought, and the impact itself generated an unexpectedly large impact dust cloud, which obscured the probe's view of the crater. The scientists were able to determine that the comet was formed somewhere between Uranus and Neptune. Deep Impact was a significant mission, as it was the first time material was ejected from a comet's surface and studied, as previous missions, such as Deep Space One and Stardust, were only flyby missions. After completing its primary mission, Deep Impact was sent off to study the comet Hartley 2, returning some great photographs of the peanut-shaped comet. Sadly, in August 2013, communication with the spacecraft was unexpectedly lost. On January the 16th in 1969, the Soviet spacecraft Soyuz 4 and Soyuz 5 performed the first ever docking of manned spacecraft in orbit, and then the first ever transfer of crew from one space vehicle to another, and then the only time such a transfer was accomplished with a spacewalk. The Soyuz spacecraft only possessed primitive docking assemblies with no internal tunnel for the crew to transfer through, hence the need for a spacewalk to transfer the cosmonauts from one vehicle to another. Soyuz 4 and 5 would separate after about four and a half hours being docked together. Soyuz 4 re-entered safely and landed in Kazakhstan, whereas the re-entry of Soyuz 5 was a far more dramatic affair. The re-entry module didn't separate from the rest of the vehicle, so the craft entered the atmosphere nose first, leaving cosmonaut Boris Volinov hanging by his restraining straps. The atmosphere began burning through the module, but luckily the craft righted itself before the escape hatch had completely burned through. Just when things didn't seem like they could get much worse, the parachute lines then became tangled, and the landing rockets failed, resulting in a very hard landing that broke Volinov's teeth. The capsule came down in the Ural Mountains, far short of its target landing site in Kazakhstan, and knowing it would take several hours before rescue teams could find him, Volinov abandoned the capsule and walked for several kilometers to take shelter at a local peasant's house. Volinov would eventually fly again, seven years later, aboard Soyuz 21. 
The other event that took place on January the 16th was the 2003 launch of STS-107, which would be the final time Space Shuttle Columbia, the first ever space shuttle, would fly. The vehicle would tragically disintegrate on re-entry 16 days later, which resulted in the deaths of all seven crew members. The disintegration was caused by damage caused by a piece of foam insulation, which broke off from the external fuel tank and struck the left wing of Columbia during the launch. When the vehicle re-entered the atmosphere, the damage allowed hot gases to penetrate the heat shield and destroy the internal wing structure, which caused the spacecraft to become unstable and ultimately break apart. The disaster resulted in the grounding of all remaining space shuttles for two years, pausing the construction of the International Space Station in the process. NASA ultimately made the decision to mandate thorough on-orbit inspection of space shuttles to ensure that their thermal protection system had endured launch, with a designated rescue mission ready in case irreparable damage was found. Furthermore, all space shuttle missions, aside from one final mission to launch the Hubble Space Telescope, were only flown to the International Space Station so that the crew could use it as a haven if damage to the orbiter prevented safe re-entry. The United States eventually ended its space shuttle program in 2011, and the fallout of the Columbia disaster was almost certainly a driving factor in this decision. Our final space anniversary of this week takes place on January the 17th, and is the 1997 launch of a Delta II rocket carrying the GPS-2 2R1 satellite, which exploded 13 seconds after launching from Cape Canaveral. An investigation was subsequently launched, and it was found that the failure was caused by a crack in the casing of one of the rocket's solid rocket motors. 12 seconds into the flight, the solid rocket booster casing ruptured, and debris struck the adjacent SRB, causing that to fail as well. One second later, the range safety destruction charges were automatically activated, causing the rocket to initiate its self-destruct system, detonating the remaining SRBs and resulting in the destruction of the main rocket core. The payload and fairing were jettisoned from the doomed machine and survived until they hit the ground, at, at which point they were very much destroyed. It was concluded that the booster had been damaged by pressure from a support in a recently introduced new transportation system. Following the January the 17th launch failure, the system was revised and ultrasound inspections of boosters on future flights were introduced. Luckily, this being an uncrewed flight, there were no fatalities, though there was some damage done to some nearby parked vehicles and some nearby buildings. And that brings an end to the most interesting historic anniversaries set to take place this week. And with that, another episode of Space This Week is over! I do hope you enjoyed today's video, and of course it goes without saying that I do hope you enjoy the, hopefully, three successful launches we're about to see this week. And who knows, maybe SpaceX will reveal a launch day for the very exciting high altitude flight of the SN9. 2021 is certainly going to be an exciting year for spaceflight, and this week looks like it'll be a great one to watch. If you want to watch more videos like this one, then there's now a link on screen to the full Space This Week playlist on the left hand side. To the right you'll find a video from my channel that YouTube's automatic recommendation system thinks you'll like, and below both of those panels are links to subscribe and to support me on Patreon to help keep the show afloat. I'll see you on Saturday for the next Kerbal Adventure, and on Monday for some more space news.